here my case, and then we can continue the back and forth discussions. Uh, the case, I put a five question mark here, democracy design, five question marks, which means where, when, why, who, and how. Uh, the case is uh, a real uh, situation, a real story happened in a village I live. Uh, from summer of 2022 to early spring of 2023. Uh, the situation, uh, the reason I would like to bring this case to your attention is that uh, in an example, say economy of the diary industry, which is relatively large, uh, a fundamental question is where are the cows and how they live? So, so I mean, at the very bottom, down to the reality, what is exactly going on when we're talking about uh, democracy and design of democracy? Uh, I think we can ask the same question, where exactly it is, uh, this thing called democracy? Uh, I use this case uh, because it, it, it's located in a village with no organization. I mean, the lowest, uh, the bottom grassroots organization in the United States should be a Home Owners Association, HOA. They regulate uh, how your uh, property looks like from outside. But uh, here in this village, there is no such organization. So, so every, uh, every person is a pure individual. Uh, and a minimum form of government we do have here is the post office. If you remember, there is a movie called Postman. Postman come, uh, uh, re re recover, deliver the, the mail, means order uh, comes back after the war. So, so, so my focus is when we talk about uh, designing democracy with our fancy models, a uh, VSM or mm, things similar to that, uh, we really need to pay attention to this five question marks, where, why, when, who, and how. Uh, so what is the democracy? So, so we need to know the other five W's. How do you design and improve solve the real problem? The real problem uh, here, I'm going to uh, let you know, here is the sun, some contextual background. Uh, the, the date I already mentioned, the location is a desert village uh, at a far suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. And the stakeholders involved in this story are 28 families living in this area. Uh, but uh, 28 families share a common road. But uh, this road is not maintained by the government. This road is shared private road. Now, if there is, it's not, um, it's not paved, it's just a, uh, uh, it's just some um, stones and gravels, uh, and uh, it's just naturally staying there, like uh, uh, like people drive on it, and uh, and it became a road more and more. And the the, the county gave it a name called uh, twenty two o two hundred first Avenue. Yeah, two hundred first Avenue. Now the problem. The problem is this road is broken. Uh, a list of reasons causes it's broken. Uh, one would be uh, the heavy construction trucks uh, with a heavy load hit the road so hard. The other is the summer storm. We had a, a pretty severe summer rainstorm in this area, so it causes water to flow on the road and damage the road. 
So this is the situation. And uh, when this 28 families facing the same problem, the shared problem, the broken road, and our only hope is to do some self-organization and to find out a cooperative problem solving uh, to resolve the issue. This is the map of the area. This is the road I'm talking about. Each yellow dot is a, a house, uh, i.e. A, a family or a property owner. So, so you see everybody uses this road and, uh, and this road, it looks like this. Uh, after the rain, you see the water pulsing like a river, pulsing like a river, and they created a hose like this. Okay, so at the beginning, people just drive around this hose. So nobody cares because nobody knows how to deal with that because for each individual owner, it's beyond their capacity to think about uh, repairing the road. So, so you see the road becomes this huge part. It's like a, in the Mars or, or, or in the moon. And uh, what triggers, if you see, uh, these are the mailboxes, mailboxes. And, and usually the post office will deliver the mail to every family. But the situation became so bad that the post office decided, uh, send us a notice saying that we will no longer deliver mails to your houses because it's too dangerous for our staff. Uh, so, so if you can see that this is a more than the height of a regular car tire. So if you drop this here, it's very hard to get out. So at this point, Jason, I mean, my wife and I says, well, we have to do something. And we launched a fundraising uh, effort. We knocked those, uh, we posted a, a notice and held meetings, blah, blah, blah. And we, we put the money together. We bought this thing called the milling and uh, we repaved, repaired the road. So it takes about uh, uh, nearly one year to accomplish this project. Now, the situation it worth to be discussed is we have no government here and we have no market uh, and we just have a we the people, but the we uh, is defined by this common problem. Perception of a problem that belongs to one, to no one, but to everyone. This is a public good issue. When public here is ill defined, property right is unclear. Who owns this road is not clear. Uh, some say it's the easement of the private property. So the, the, the owner near the road has the responsibility to maintain it. But uh, nobody buys thinking that because uh, because uh, the road is used by everybody in this area. Okay, so not just the owners. Uh, endurance threshold passed. Uh, at the beginning, you, you see the road developed in such big holes, and everybody was trying to go around it. And, uh, well, we're seeing it, but uh, we have nothing to do, or that we can do nothing. So, so until the problem it becomes so worse, it becomes unbearable to not everyone, <laughs> half of the family. So it's about 15 families of the 28 participated in the fundraising and, uh, and organized together to repair it. Uh, so uh, Half of the people care about the public good, uh, public issue. Half of them remain silent, quiet, and uh, they they want to be free riders. Okay, you guys repair the road. That's good, <laughs> but that's none of my business. So. Uh, all 
also during the process of the, the effort of repairing the throat, uh, some people are making negative comments. Some people are saying, well, mm, uh, it's against the law to do the repair by yourself. The country has a code, has a compliance issue that, should, that we need to follow. And uh, uh, people try to call the county. Uh, they say, it's none of our business. It's, it, it's a private road. You guys deal with it yourself. Uh, what I found through this experience is that the cooperation uh, called off by our flyers and uh, uh, and the public uh, meetings uh, has a limit. You always have people who do not care and uh, who do not want uh, to to contribute, but they want to take advantage. I think. I think it is the same situation in other levels of organizations, in the state level, national level as well. So uh, what are some of the ways to raise the participation uh, percentage is my main question to you guys. Uh, I mean, in term, in the framework of designing democracy, if you were here with your VSM model, uh, with all the advanced cybernetics knowledge, how would you deal with this situation uh, better? Uh, now, this year, after the ring, the road is starting uh, having uh, ditches as well. Some smaller holes is emerge, emerging. So, uh, so maybe we are facing the same problem after one year or two, that the road will be broken again. Uh, and we have a few more families, uh, a few more houses built in. So, so it's, it's about a 30-ish uh, something. So, so this is a very practical question I'm asking your help. How, how would you deal with this question? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, one key is the property rights. Uh, it's not clear of this road. How can we establish a, a framework uh, of responsibility for the broken road? Uh, okay, so I will stop that. That, uh, that, that, uh, that, that is my major question. Uh, I would like to hear your um, I have, uh, advice. I have five go minutes. ahead, please. May I go first? I have five minutes. I have to leave in five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Can you comment on this? Yes, please. I'm sorry, guys, but there is another Cybernetics UK meeting in, in five minutes in England with uh, Carl Friston. So that's why <laughs> I better go there. Anyway, uh, democracy. Uh, I don't think uh, it works because there's always uh, the chance of 49.9% <laughs> says no. And that is, uh, of course, difficult to uh, reconcile. So you need to have a, a way to, uh, uh, for the purpose of everybody, you have to select what is the what is the purpose and the value for a good road, first of all? And is it shared by everybody? Um, and so not only the loafers, you know, the, the free riders, but the free riders also make use of it. So I designed something different. It's called the notocracy. Notocracy is, is, a, is a governance by information. Notic noticia is information in Latin. And cracy is, cracia is the democracy or the, uh, the, the governance in Greek. Noticracy is information-based. So everybody should have the information that we have a purpose to use the road. The use is useful for us because it saves time, it saves, it saves, it saves money and so on. And we maintain it together as a community. Now, information that is therefore uh, ignored by, by other, by people, uh, by the 50%, 49%, is still valid because as I find in my research, 
information is the energy to function. So the functionality comes into play. So if you look at the functionality that is for everybody the same of the road in this case, then we can, uh, you know, um, end the democracy, democracy, democracy process and say, okay, with the information and the goals we all share, the advantages we all share, have then the preference, and then we can, you know, easily avoid the democ democratic, uh, democratic process by talking too long. That's my, that's my take in three minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Graham, Robbie. Well, uh, Jason, you asked a question. I, my question, my question is how yes. your how your models can help us to improve. Uh, yes, you the you ask a question how to get beyond the fifty percent. Yeah, and my purpose uh, in listing in this meeting was precisely to get an answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> We're relying I, I on... mean, the, the, the point is, my, my comment is, uh, your example uh, is a very good one, but it may be not very representative because the problem is very evident. And it should be also very evident uh, to the free riders. But uh, when I'm dealing with issues of uh, climate change, uh, social transformation with regard to uh, to climate change, ecological problem, and all of that. Those are real urgent problems, but they are not evident to the individual. And so uh, I think uh, your problem uh, is very interesting and a good example, but uh, not very representative. And if we take more representative uh, problems, I'm afraid the 50% will go down much more even. So I can only join your question to ask. Thank you. Robin. I noticed from, uh, from, your from your photographs that you made no provision for drainage. There didn't seem to be any provision for drainage when you rebuilt the road. So I think um, that's a, <laughs> that's something which a practical thing which you would have to think about. <laughs> um, but coming back to your question, I, I, mean, I think that both you and I live in a society which um, prioritizes the individual, if you like. And so it is quite natural for individuals not to... Uh, take very much notice of what's going on around them and, and if they can get a free ride on something they think they're doing doing very well uh, but I mean in this particular case uh, the problem for everybody was very evident I would have thought so your 50% seems um, quite uh, surprising in some ways um, but I, I guess that you know, for various reasons they, they may not have been interested so but the point I think is that it's a long term changing of minds problem that you've got in our societies to get away from thinking just in terms of yourself, your your individual self and thinking about uh, how you work with other people. And we don't do that at all uh, or very little in, in our world. I think there are cultures in the world which do that uh, and I was struck when um, Lisa was talking. Um, I came across very recently a book by Robin Wall Kimmerer, mm -hmm. uh, an American professor of something I can't remember now, um, mm -hmm. who wrote about uh, the land and how the first peoples in the United States and Canada lived very much with the land. Uh, and I think that uh, she she is also a systems thinker. So that's a book I would recommend um, for people to look at. Yeah, uh, braiding, those... braiding sweet grass. Yes, yeah. And and there's recently an edition for young adults, which is great. Um, oh, good. Yeah. Just let me interject real quick, Jason. Thank you for that uh, case because it helped me understand when Arend was asking, "What is my goal?" I realized like the same work with the Source School. Actually, it's about civil dialogue. It, mm -hmm. It's really about helping people come off the polarities. So 
and and see the spaces in between. And of course, those spaces in between are, are of positionality and also constant changing environments and and how we can respond. So I think that this is back to that information as control issue. That's very interesting. But also you, you um, I think there's a lot of research which um, says that, if you like, or the results of it say that when people, two people do start talking together, the, these differences do disappear and these uh, generalizations which we hold in our heads about others kind of thing uh, melt away because you now have faced with a, a, a real person that you're actually talking to who has views and you you do listen and engage with that I think most mostly if you into particularly so if you have a purpose a common purpose let's say then that that helps a lot and I, I, this is both situations I think isn't it yeah, Ram, are you going to say something about signal and noise now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jason, can, can you put back your uh, your slide? Yeah. Mm. It's okay. No, I, I, I'll wait. Okay. Is somebody else wanting to talk? Yes. This, this last one? Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say, that I, while the, you know, the way you phrase this, it's so beautiful. I feel it fits with the model that I presented last week. So what I want to explain to you is the uh, very the first sentence, what, what it is describing in my, in my model is the concept of an open system. That is, <clears throat> the problem is not really bounded at all. There's a lot of things happening from different places and there are different participants. That's what I call as the open system. So the, that is, in other words, the problem does not belong to um, anyone, but actually it also belongs to everyone. So that's the idea of open system. The second one is very nice. What you said, endurance threshold is passed. And here, what is happening is that there are two things. There are people who are just doing their own things every day and uh, continuing to do, which is a continuous process. And in my mathematical model, that's what I described as an exponential process. It just keeps on doing whatever it is doing at a certain rate. But then suddenly what happened is you got a poison input, a, a discrete input into the system from the postmaster said, hey, I'm not delivering your mail anymore, <laughs> right? So that that's a sudden, uh, external input that is coming in. So this is what I'm saying in an open system. Now we have two complementary things, the poison input, the discrete, and then the continuous exponential. They are both working together and you reach the criticality, the threshold, at which point it says, hey, no more mail, <laughs> right? So that is the second beautiful point. And when the threshold happens, now you need an emergent phenomena, something is spike, in case of brain, it's a spiking. Or in, in this case, you need to do something. The motivation came in. And then the third thing is the, when you're talking about these next steps, the bell curve and the signing up. And that's what I sh was talking about as a sigmoidal process. That sigma curve that I showed, it has three phases, a rapid exponential phase in the beginning, some activity, then like a steady linear process. And then you have a very slow uh, exponential that reaches the asymptotic limit. So now if you apply that bell curve idea here, what we did is very quickly, a few of you got together and tried to say, hey, we must solve this problem. That's a rapid exponential activity, the initial part of the uh, the sigma, dot, not the bell curve, but, but the integral of that, which is the sigma, a fast activity happened, right? Then, <laughs> the linear process is, okay, from that initial two or three people who got together over a drink or a coffee and said, I'm going to do something, then you got half of the people, some uh, or 50% of the people got together. And that is where you made a lot more discussions and tried to do something. That is the linear part of the change process. But then eventually when you go towards the asymptotic, you will never be able to get everybody and means okay, either they're monetarily, they're not able to participate or they just don't care and say, hey, I have a pickup truck that can go over any any part or I don't care, right? Or I say, I don't receive mail, I, why do I have to pay for this? Yeah, that's, you, you can't convert everyone. So you have to assume 
that the, uh, it is an asymptotic process will never reach 100% limit. <coughs> So the, this is the uh, the, cyber, the cybernetic process that I was describing, the sigmoidal process. You can see right false in here. The problem is we define democracy as just a linear process, uh, but we have to really think about it as a, a systems evolutionary process. The whole thing, all three phases together, is what governance is all about, right? So. Yeah. Um, where I was going with this was in order to go from 50% to maybe try to get it up to 80% or 90%, what you have to do is the population in the middle of the curve, the, in the in the bell curve, you had to get to that 67% uh, you need to bring in. You already had the initial people who came in with the 17%. If you can get the 16 and 67, you can get 85%, and there's probably plenty. Uh, so once you're gone from somewhat authoritarian view and then gone into the democratic process, eventually you get to the socialistic point where the whole thing is not going to converge. But to increase the democratic process, that is where you need to have a community activities. For example, I'm saying, okay, out of these few people who initially became involved, you pick up some friends and you set up like, find a person who is not willing yet, but who is interested in your books, set up a book club, right? or somebody with the sports things, or you have some kids and you have some kids activity, okay, or you have a theology, the, the, get the pastor to appeal to some, some people, right, or work on the school or whatever it is. So what I'm saying is now you do subdivide into a lot of activities and start kind of working on it, which in my brain model, I call that as the epigenetic change. You have to change the memory of the system. You have to work at it and you have to build the gene modification into it so that in future you don't have to keep on doing this and the population in the middle portion of your sigma now increases. And so I'm saying the second part, to go from 50% to higher, you need community activities, but it is not going to be one thing for all. Each person has a heart button and one of the converts need to somehow appeal to a, a, a buddy with a common interest and build up the group. And if you get to like 85%, you are already home. That's really what you're going to do. And then eventually these stragglers, some of them will show up. So this is the cybernetics view that I presented last week. I feel applies very nicely into uh, how you phrase this whole problem. And I'm really excited to see an application right away. <laughs> That's all okay. I want to say. <laughs> I haven't heard you. Uh, some more interesting, more complexities. I stepped out as a leader to initialize this project and I got attacked. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because one of the neighbors says, Jason, you need to go knock everybody's door and force every family to join. <laughs> I said, well, it's not my way of doing things. I, I put public flyer there. I invite people to sign up the mailing list. Uh, we established a Google uh, Google Mail group. And, and I think we do invitation and we will let people to decide if they will join or not. But uh, this neighbor, uh, start uh, cursing me, saying, saying, uh, you are co coward. You should go knock everybody's door <laughs> one by one and ask everybody to chip in. So we had a, we had a different opinion and said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so so the, the argument becomes so fierce and I resigned. <laughs> I, I asked a, a younger people, a younger neighbor to take over the fund management. And so, so that is uh, one thing. But and later, okay, later the, the government, the, the, one of you mentioned that, there is a cold drainage issue that the government intervened, said that you need a grading permit for doing this. So, so the interesting role of the government is 
when you have a problem, you have a broken road, they say it's none of obvious. But when you are trying to repair it by yourself, they say you need a permit. And if you don't have a permit, you get a fine. So, so that is more complexity. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, you, you, you have something to say. Yeah, interesting problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, I find the situation highly unusual in the in this normal sense of how governments operate, and so uh, I looked at uh, what were, uh, an engineer in the government years and years ago told me: when you have this sort of problem, uh, you push it back up the system, and he he knew exactly which system he was talking about when <laughs> when you get something from top down and. It doesn't uh, work very well. So push it back up the system. What does that mean in this case? Uh, it, it turns out that uh, in the Western states, like Arizona and California, you have very, very few counties, uh, as opposed to here in, in Minnesota, uh, we have 82 counties. So it would be very direct to go to the county commissioners and, and talk to them about what the situation was. Uh, and they're responsible for the roads in the county. But apparently in, in, in Arizona, there's only 15 counties. And the, the, Arizona was a huge state. And, and so each county uh, covers what? Hundreds of, square mile, hundreds of square miles. Yeah. And it turns out also that uh, apparently in Arizona, there are only 90 incorporated towns. So that would be the second, but you're not incorporated. No, no, that's the problem. <laughs> okay, so maybe the thing to do is to become incorporated. Well, what about a homeowner? People don't I... like that because once you're incorporated, there is a tax issue. You have to, who will pay the mayor? I mean, the, <laughs> you have to find money to, to pay the administration. Yeah, but so, in, can... independent of that, there has to be. Uh, some set of regulations uh, about who is responsible for the roads in the state as a total. You're and a private uh, citizen. You, you, you are on your own. <laughs> there is no government, not a government as business to, to, to well, repair your road. That, that's, what they, that's what they've told you, Jason. But the, I'm questioning of how do you push it back up the system? Well, uh, more complexity added. We also have a horse wrench, previously horse wrench, which was damaged by the rain. So we did some private project on the horse wrench. Uh, uh, wrench. Uh, one thing we did is we buried a culvert um, to guide the rainwater. Now, because we did that without knowing that there's a regulation about doing anything like that. <laughs> so, so we got a complaint. <laughs> and so said, we did it illegally. So we, re we received a notice uh, from the county saying an uh, order to comply, saying uh, you did something uh, to change the the natural flow of the rainwater, uh, which is so. So we are asking two things. One is to to do a, a, to apply for a permit, which we did. The second thing is uh, we have to recover it to the natural flow, or we have to provide a drainage clearance report by a professional Arizona registered civil engineer. And we asked around that report cost at least $3,000 for them to give you one. So we had no way, we don't want to spend another $3,000. So we had to dig that covered out. That's the solution. <laughs> Actually, I put an American flag there, and I hired some some machinery. And we we actually dig it out last week, you know, for the compliance issue. 
So, so the government, so we did good things by self-organization and we are not rewarded but punished. Well, reasonably because the government only care about the flood situation. So, so they set up a lot of code there that uh, anyone who, who manipulate with the rainwater, uh, like a digging a trench uh, or uh, need oh. their permission, then the permission in the engineering evaluation. So it becomes extremely expensive. Uh, so, so we cannot just do things without common sense. Uh, so a couple of questions then. Number one, uh, so each of the houses there uh, has its own independent water and sewer access or separate. Yeah, and, and yeah. every has its own sewer. And so there's no building permits either then. That they need a building permit when you build your house. We we didn't build, we we purchased from a previous owner. So and, and so who gives the the county gives the building permit and not county. Uh, somebody if you want to move the dirt around the uh, grading you need to go online to submit an application. And they charge you a fee and they do some review and they say, okay, you can go ahead, do it. Hmm. Well, it's, I, find, I find it to be a very unique situation, but I, I would add one bit of, of sort of factual background to it that, uh, and, and this goes back to European laws and, and whatnot is that, uh, it's almost a, a, a sacred duty, uh, it, it seems to be, to preserve the natural flow of water. And, and this uh, uh, natural flow of water, it, it seems to be universal, as far as I know, in, in all governmental territories. Uh, because it, if you change the flow of water, you may change the neighbor's properties as well as your own. And, and so that part is seems to underlie the the uh, basic yeah, situations we, that you describe. We followed that uh, uh, because when we purchased, we did get a, a, a notice saying that uh, this is the entrance of the wash, this is the exit of the wash, you cannot uh, change that, but inside your property, you can do anything you want. So that's what we did. Uh, we, we build a trench inside of the property to regulate water. And because this was used as a horse ranch, the, the soils were, were destroyed by horse, horses, uh, like more than 10 years or 12 years of uh, uh, eight horses living here, <laughs> running around widely. So, so there is no so-called natural flow. Uh, yeah. It's all going around everywhere. So if we want to use this land, we have to do something. So that's what we that's what we did. Lisa, you have Just, a question? Yeah, when you say we, who is the we? Are you like where we I is live? my wife and I? <laughs> okay. And first of all, that that's like I'm really interested in how that dynamic has been working in this whole conflict, but that's another story. Uh, but so here, uh, we're part of a homeowners association, and people pay dues for shared access to the lake, a path and a circle. But it's a tricky one, because the village with their water management is destroying the ravine system. And our road is private, but we allow heavy trucks to come because of build, you know, building um, initiatives by independent, you know, private homeowners here or the village uh, services us. So it's this agreement, but it, that's a whole other story. I can tell you another time about the conflict and where the homeowners association was divided 50-50, just like you say, around privacy, who gets to use the road. So that sparked a really difficult set of relationships and the community spirit has is basically gone now as a result of those uh, differences. Um, and then the, the board gutted the communication system. So we used to have all of our addresses copied in communication. They now blind copy everyone. It's, it's, it's sad. Um, but I'm curious about like when, what about these groups of however many homes you showed on the map becoming 
a homeowners association to deal with the costs. You know, uh, this is a rural area. The villagers uh, are more freedom driven. <laughs> they, they they escape like us ourselves. We lived used to live inside the city and all, always under whole HOA and. and uh, uh, frequently will receive the notice that uh, your, your weed is growing, uh, things like that. Uh, your tree needs to be trimmed, things like that. So, so by moving here, we mistakenly think that, uh, okay, we are now free <laughs> of all these regulations. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, suddenly we run into a, a problem of a broken road. You have to find out uh, the solution. I really hope that uh, the, the abstract uh, academic thinking of the models and theories could actually can be linked to this kind of the real world cases so that it really offers a help. It's Jason, like, how can we do better? Yeah, back to natural law though, right. The water is going to go where the water wants to go. It doesn't care whose property or, but are, are there... Like here, I've built a series of ephemeral ponds to collect neighbors' houses at the lowest uh, point. And so rather than fighting it, so totally within, like you said, the domain that I steward, I have the ability to, to create these ephemeral ponds that the water collects at various times of the year and then is absorbed um, so is there any kind of, like, have you had any, maybe a consulting arborist or someone who understands water flow in the Southwest to consult rather than the engineered solutions that I find are very heavy handed? Uh, we had, uh, in our case, uh, oh, we, we only have something called the common sense. It's uh, when the water, the rainwater flow in the natural land, uh, year after year, it cut into its own trench. But uh, in our property, particularly, the situation is more tricky because the, the horse, the horse damaged the soil. So there is no such well cut lands. So that is that forced us. We have to build an artificial trench to let to, to guide the water. So that is something violent that permission thing that you do. you have to get a permission first. <laughs> is there any plants that uh, would be able to absorb some of the water? Uh, like, plant? The, yeah, there escape, I think it's called in the uh, sample. The water, the water went to the south direction naturally and ended up in a canal. So, so for us, it's just, uh, it's just uh, during the uh, severe uh, storm that uh, we need to uh, regulate the water flows, not causing too much damage. There, there is a, the, the system's principle that if you make a small change in an appropriate place, you might be able to manage the flow without anybody noticing. <laughs> yeah. Larry, <laughs> you, you, we haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, again. Uh, I guess that the, what, as I'm listening, I, the word that, that I want to bring to attention is the word purpose. And I, th I think that when we talk about purpose and what I hear when people talk about purpose is they equate it with a goal. And that's what I want to question. Uh, the problem with a goal, a goal is, is uh, it brings, brings forth an image of a point, a, a target in the future, a point concept. And the problem with that is that First of all, we don't know what the future is going to bring. And, and that's in some people's minds here, I'm sure. Uh, and we don't know, you know, and then there are people who have conflicting uh, desires. Uh, and that's that's not been brought up. Maybe everyone does have an interest in this road. 
uh, but maybe they have other interests and maybe those are conflicting. And so in a democracy, a democracy, I say, can't exist without conversation. And in order to have a conversation about desires uh, uh, and to get at this idea of purpose in particular, perhaps rather than think of it as a goal and something to be achieved, think about it as constraints. Think about it as what we don't want to happen and what everyone can, can maybe come to an agreement on, maybe, about what they don't want want to happen. And that's not just that they don't want a, you know, a, a, a broken road, it's that they want their mail maybe to cut to come rather than having to, to take go out in the post office, they don't want their car to be damaged. But they also, you know, this 50% uh, so-called freeloaders could also be called frugal. They're, they're very careful with their time and their money. And uh, uh, if they don't have to, they won't, you know, to, to participate in, in that way, then they won't. But getting them together on what they might, uh, you know, have an interest in getting together on is, is a place where I would start. Well, you're saying what kind of, uh, what kind of the, uh, incentive to uh, uh, that you suggest that we can attract them in? Well, that's, I mean, the, the problem with incentives is even though you, you know, you, you talk about the spillage as being out, out in this rural area, you know, as, and as you say, it's, it's not really disconnected. It, it's very much connected with uh, what happens elsewhere. Uh, but if, 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 you know, the incentive for people to be full their wealth, to, to, to build security, uh, or in some cases, and I don't even know. You know, maybe there are people there that that, that are having trouble putting food on the plates every every day, and that and the, and that's why they're very frugal. I I don't know, but uh, uh, the incentives come from the economic system that, in which you all and we all you know currently exist, uh, where where e either basic needs, the most basic human needs, are not being met universally, or uh, uh, th there's there's real value, uh, self, and this is the self-interest, I think, that Robin was talking about. There's real self-interest in, in building your own uh, nest egg or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, being very careful about how you spend your money and your time. It's not necessarily due to frugality, though. So if you think about billionaires not wanting to raise the minimum wages or don't want to pay for unemployment insurance, uh, unemployment compensation and things like that. It's not frugality that motivates them. It, it, it is a lack of trust in the system that money is being wasted or thinking that the other guy is just to, doesn't want to work and wants to be a freeloader, putting them in a box. So this is where the whole issue of trust and camaraderie comes in, right? So we, we need to really work together and it's not this one particular issue of the road it, it next day it will apply to something else and something else so you you want to really build a, a society with many of the members as being part of it so you need to have a lot of different local interests uh, bridging small small groups and then the whole group then comes together and you have a, a total there are, solution there are there are many goals that you uh, that a community association can yeah. can do I mean, it can put on a, a, a barbecue or something like that, and, yeah. and uh, people come together to chat at right. the barbecue. Exactly, things which people will enjoy, and and that right. will attract people in. And and there are lots of other uh, kinds of things that you could do as well. I think, I mean, it's that kind of thing that brings people together and gets them talking and makes them friends. Um, yeah. And I'm saying it's really maybe the small small groups of two three people and some common some individual activity. But then one member from each of them then joins another group, joins another group. So this is the whole idea of uh, uh, concurrent activation and also um, uh, a recursive operation, right? So it, it builds yeah. up both spatially and temporally into a larger system, but not everybody is participating in every activity. So this is where, where yeah. I started in my last meeting as think globally and act locally, but yeah. you also have to sense locally and cognize globally. Though the, the sensing and cognizing is important. That is where the small activities come into play. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We in, in the last town I live, um, there were signs appeared around the town, large signs just saying kindness. 
Um, yeah. It letters about two, three feet high. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the local council um, at first objected, but then somebody sort of said, well, do you really want to be in the newspapers for, for t forcing people to take down signs which say kindness? And they backed off and uh, the kindness signs are still there. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. See, in, in, in the brain model, I equate it to the building of uh, receptors for certain neuromodulators, right? So you, epigenetic changes leads to the release of receptors and the receptor is, they need to get the dopamine when the, there is a global dopamine available, those individual neurons pick it up. And so some common neurons, when they pick, pick it up, they then fire coherently together. And that is when the change happens. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the I, I'm saying that everything you, you can take it down all the way to the quantum scale or cosmic scale. The process of how the change happens is really the same, and that is the open systems model. The cybernetics yeah. of that is communication and control. Yeah. 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 I I disagree that uh, purpose and goal mean the same thing. I mean, one can have the purpose of survival. Yeah. Uh, right. And that's not the goal. That's just um, yeah. It's not the destination, but the journey, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I would see purpose as sense making. So, Jason, maybe some storytelling uh, Saturday afternoons or Sunday afternoons, because everybody's got a different story. Like your your neighbor mm -hmm. calling you a coward, but he's or they are not willing to go. Are they willing to go knock knocking on the door with you? Yeah, they are. They ask me to go to the market. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, this, is yeah, very this brings up another story of, of of aspect of the situation, which has been alluded to here, but not directly uh, presented in your slide. And that is, what is the current uh, relationships among the thirty odd homeowners? Uh, I presume it's quite distributed uh, in the sense of close neighbors and further neighbors, et cetera, and personalities and family situations and these sorts of common social factors that, that would be influenced. But beyond those, uh, are there, uh, first of all, how large are the lots? Are they three, four, five acres? So that- uh, uh, About one acre each. About, about one, one acre, acre each? Yeah. Okay. so. You can see your neighbor going to work in the morning, so to speak. We we only had some chatting uh, when we walk our dogs. Uh, so so uh, some people like to chat. Some people just to drive through. So uh, it's not not everybody knows everybody. And we we are having three or four more houses adding to the area. So, so maybe barbecue uh, or public barbecue is it's a good idea uh, uh, to get to know each other. No annual meeting of the group or that sort of no, thing. No, no. Barbecue or... The, the repair is, the project of the road repair is called an emergency repair because it's not just a post office stop delivery. The, the, the service... Uh, Vehicles such as if somebody need an ambulance or or fire engine, they, they just cannot get in. So so that is the reason that uh, mobilized half of the family willing to participate. We call the meeting just on the on the, on the corner of the road, and people stand there chatting and trying to find out a solution. Uh, 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 and the real solution is to to bring up some money together and then somebody go went out to purchase that uh, the, the load of the materials to dump on the, in the holes uh, and somebody found uh, some tractor to spread the load that that was what we achieved more than that it's very hard to um, to get people you know well, because everybody sound, looks like very busy of their own businesses. So, well, so that's a very typical situation, I think, for the idea of a democracy. It's, it's well, really... Yeah, in, in this situation then, which is, I think it's a very rare situation that this comes up, 
but uh, it would be very difficult to construct uh, or to motivate the dis development of a social group in the normal sense. You, you would need some sort of common community building or some common facility of some fort that people could gather around. But you don't have that. <laughs> Not with such small community, though. No, th but uh, just this is what I was bringing up in an open system, and there are different elements going together. In order for that to function, you need a black box in between, right? The black box is the mapping. It needs to map the sensations to actions, or the com it needs to take the communications and bring down the controls. And that black box is missing in your system. These are 28 independent elements with no common conduit in between them. So that it's like my body doing everything by itself and my mind just wandering in space. And there is no brain in between connecting the two. You need a black box. Uh, and the black well, box with all be... due respect to cyberneticians and engineers, <laughs> uh, every human being is a member of an uh, open system. Yeah. Other human beings. And the yes. black box has nothing to do with that. No, no, the black box is... I, no, I, I said what I meant, intended to say, that the black box has nothing to do with that. That uh, That's a figment of our imagination that a black box exists. No, I'm saying Maybe. the black box is like a GPS mapping it. You need to make the two systems communicate and control each other. Without the mapping, if you cut it off, then they are isolated. You need to bring some a conduit, and the conduit is what I'm calling black box. Black box does not make it happen. It facilitates it. I, I okay. understand quite well what you're saying and why I resist that line of reasoning. <laughs> I will not develop here. But I, I will simply say that the how we conceptualize mathematics, it lies at the understanding that you are developing your concept of black box about. And there are many other ways to conceptualize mathematics without developing a black box. It's not above, it's in between. That's the key. <laughs> I quit. Oh, so what if I had a yeah, what if the women in the neighborhood act as that conduit? What do the what are the relationships between the women and also uh just seeding that, but also, you know, it I'm a cat person. I've never had a dog. I, you know, I think there's a past life reason, you know, I was probably torn apart by them. I don't know, it's some past life, but um so it just irks me so much that people on this like private area leave uh, dog feces. And for years, I've been trying like, what's the right wording to tell people, hey, cut that out. And, you know, back to Larry's example of the, you know, going to the, the lack, what we don't want. And my daughter who lives in Chicago sent me a picture the other day of this sign that I thought was great. It says, there is no poop fairy. Please pick up after your dog. So, Jason, you were the you were the road fairy. You you picked up the you know you provided the road. But I'm I'm just I'm super curious as to what you know people in bodies we call women what those relationships could mean for shifting um, the energy around uh, relationship in the community and the stories maybe that might be told by the by the the point of view so maybe your wife should come to our next meeting and oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i think we had a very interesting discussion uh anyone want to do anything to follow up well, like, maybe write up you, the case report or write a paper or something like that. <laughs> well, I just want to comment on the black box. Maybe you don't need a black box, but a mayor. What about that? Black and box. Uh, to communicate. Black box being like what? Obviously, to a female mayor. Between the two. A cowgirl. <laughs> A horsewoman. Ooh, a horsewoman. Well, actually, uh, I, the reference was to you just need a chemist there. Chemists don't deal with black boxes. Mm. They deal with the reality of atoms. And everyone must be 
represented in terms ever atom that is part of the system must be represented in the system. So it's just it's a foundational difference in logic of chemistry here that I was referring to. Oh, that's cool, Jerry. That back to that holism of part, particle, and whole. It goes back to Galen, actually. Um, Galen, in the description of human anatomy, uh, and the, at that time, and the dissection of the human body was, you know, uh, a risky thing to do. Uh, but if you start trying to deal with the anatomy of the human body, you have to take it apart, part by part by part, and then assign functions to it. And so there's no black boxes from that approach to part-whole relationships. And this, of course, then is extended to chemistry in terms of part-whole relation relationships and, and how, for example, the body functions, et cetera. So that was my the grounding for my comments about black boxes and the different forms of mathematics uh, that are used. Uh, and if you want a black box and you want to probably deal with continuous functions and something like that, where the chemist necessarily must deal with discrete functions or discrete relationship, more not just discrete functions, but discrete relationships between the parts of the whole. Hey, Jerry, so catalysis in that frame, you know, how, how Jason has been a catalyst, but uh, maybe there's more to figure out around what, you know, a, a catalyst doesn't get used up completely, but is the one who sparks something new? Uh, that metaphor is almost perfect. And that's what Robin was talking about when he's talking about trying to develop the community uh, yeah. as, as a genetic system that would mm -hmm. make the catalyst work. And so yeah. the, in the human body, the, the enzymes or the catalysts uh, that are involved are all, already have a plan that is given to them by the genetic system. So, so that, in social system, uh, uh, can we call uh, facilitators serve as that role, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jerry, will you tell us more about chemistry and catalysis next yeah, time? Yeah, it's all in included in the atomic chart. So you just look at the atomic chart and study it diligently for a few decades, and you'll see the answer. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are the atomic chart that all those chemicals are in us and the earth. Yes, yes, that's the basis well, of my well, question. Uh, since <laughs> you're talking about this, the atomic chart, Jerry, uh, 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 is there any literature that uh, delineates the the connection between your chemical processes? Uh, to all the way to the emergence of uh, cognition and uh, consciousness. Consciousness, of course, there is. I mean, I mean, the, the layer by layer, uh, who presented it uh, more clearly? You haven't read my publications, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Through us some links. <laughs> That's quick. <and> <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's interesting because I've just submitted an abstract on the uh, metaphysics uh, of uh, chemistry. And I think that's probably what you're interested in. Yes, yes, yes. Please bring it over here and so that we may have another session. Listen to you. On the metaphysics of chemistry? You really like no, the, the, yes, uh, yes, I'm yes. particularly interested in the layer by layer structure, what I call multi layer self organization. Well, so you have your chemistry thing going on at the very bottom, and then going up a little bit is in the biological level of uh, reactions going on. And uh, up and up, uh, boom, something, there's something called a consciousness emerges. But then even consciousness has different layers, I think. Like, uh, like all emotional reaction might be at a lower level. And all rational thinking, uh, for critical thinking, might have to be the higher level. So, so, so I'm interested in clarifying this structure. What what is, well, uh, you have, uh, yeah, 
Let me just say that for the last 50 odd years, I've been interested in that very same structure you're talking about. But from the perspective of public health, as uh, from the molecular perspective, in other words, toxins and poisons that influence the body uh, and end up as public health problems, uh, carcin carcinogens would be a good example, or what, what's a safe and effective drug? And, and that's what I did at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so I appreciate the depth of your question and I appreciate why you're concerned about it. Uh, it is a bit of a complicated problem though, and it involves a lot of different uh, metaphysical concepts. And at the base of this though, lies a distinction between the individual structure of each atom and the composition of these individuals into the whole. And this cannot be approached basically from the continuous functions view of mathematics uh, and, and, and most engineering mathematics. Okay, and this is why information theory gets so much controversy is surrounded with it because there is uh, the discreteness of bits and bytes. Uh, by the way, the black and white cat is, is that was bits that you see on the screen when she comes by. Uh, but the uh, bites is much shyer, and she never comes up. But anyway, bits and bites is the origin of this distinction between uh, the the continuity issues that are so profound in Kantian perspectives of uh, space time versus the discrete individual of each atom, which is well documented in the table of elements, and the independence of each of the table. Organ each of the atoms in the table of elements. Each name is a separate entity. It has its own identity. And this is another conflict in the relationship between mathematics and chemistry. And so, uh, you know, you, you've, uh, you've ignited a whole line string of arguments and relationships. But underlying all of this is the relationship between syntax and semantics and uh, the engineering community, the mathematics community, uh, pretends that no natural taxonomy is necessary, that syntax is something you can just assign arbitrarily and capriciously to any function you wish. And uh, that notion of syntax is not associated with taxonomy uh, unless you enter into a particular uh, axiomatic system. And if you enter into that axiomatic system, then you have other constraints that bother you. And VSM is a good example of where these constraints can be organized in such a way uh, that are profoundly useful. Uh, but that VSM sort of thing doesn't work very well for anatomy. I think it does. Um, good, Stafford's, good. <laughs> Stafford's uh, first book, um, the Stafford Beer's first book was um, The Brain of the Firm. Um, which uh, he used the human anatomy to develop the VSM. Uh, it, that, that was where he, where it came from. So uh, I think that that's not not the case that it, it doesn't do anatomy. I think it is anatomy. And, and that, so, so, so did was, Ashby, right? Yeah. Well, that was just can, an I, analogy. I can I can understand why people might believe that, but I would suggest that, that Stafford Beer didn't do much chemistry in his book, did he? No, no, well, I, that's right. He didn't, but I think, and no me, genetics anyway, either. My, huh? my, my, my opinion is that uh, there are two paradigms here. The process paradigm is quite separate from the um, and fundamental uh, underneath the object paradigm, which we use in our normal science. So that um, the biological world is a process world, not not at all an object world. Oh, if you start with that premise, then I agree with you. Jerry, what about the energy body? So Jason, you were talking about the mental body, the emotional body, but so I've trained for a very long time in hands-on integrated energy work. And, and so there are layers of this electromagnetic field that we are. Um, and so by the time an illness manifests, in symptoms, it's at a very dense level close to the body, but that dis-ease 
starts way out in the field of like the etheric uh, field. So it's much subtler. So I think like it, it's not only our anatomy, but it's the energy, you know, in in this space that extends beyond the physical body. So there's there's something that I'm curious about that in the system. Like I'd love to hear more about how VSM might address not only the the anatomy, but um, the energy between us and that through communication, how that gets, you know, words create worlds and reactions back into our nervous systems that take us off the center. So, um, and also too, it's very interesting when you're doing hands-on energy healing, you, it's, you carve yourself out because the person on the table, it's a very sacred space to be in, but the, the person who is um, offering that space really needs to carve themselves out because the person on the table is doing their own healing and integration. You're, you're really just sort of a conduit for what they can integrate. And it, and it's also, again, it's not it just, you know, in that session that it's going to happen, it works, you know, days, hours, months, weeks beyond, which is also interestingly how stories work us. You hear a story, it sparks some memory or some story of yours, and that that continues to move out into um, more flow in the system. I think it's like really about energy flow. I think Lisa is focused on the very top uh, extreme, why the, the jury is focused on very bottom extreme. No. Yeah, I think that's a very important, it's a very important distinction you're making there, Jason. Very, very important. Because whatever I have just talked about, my starting assumption was the material reality of the individual chemical elements and the table of elements and construction from there on to more and more complicated systems. So I was not starting with set theory or any axiomatic theory of mathematics whatsoever. I was not starting at that point. Uh, I was not starting with physics and physical beliefs about space-time and quantum theory and thermodynamics and all that. That was not my starting point for my argument, okay? And so it's very important that this distinction is made at the very beginning. Otherwise, I, by and large, I can do enough mathematics to do simple engineering. And uh, I spent many years studying chemical reaction kinetics, which are all based on continuous functions. Uh, and actually, Lisa bringing up the notion of catalysis, uh, the, the fact that catalysis is normally expressed uh, in mathematics and in physiology and pharmacokinetics, et cetera, is in terms of continuous functions of, of discrete molecules. Uh, so uh, that's not the issue of continuity versus discreteness per se. It's the issue of where do you start your concatenation of arguments such that you construct a system that is functional. And that is, uh, I wanted to make that very, very clear because there's lots and lots of room for uh, misunderstanding here <laughs> as, as very one well known. One perspective is to do comparisons. Uh, it's like um, my partner of my cognitive science study is my GSD dog. So I, I have been trying to understand the cognition system of my dog. And uh, I noticed that, uh, uh, well, of course, number one, he is a stubborn. And number two, uh, he thinks locally, <laughs> and very particularly on the current moment of what his attention is at. and. Uh, and he can have a very simple perception of a cause and effect, uh, but a, never a system thinker. Uh, so, so it's everything is very straightforward for my dog. So, so I'm I'm curious as how then how did my brain develop to so called better than my dog's brain? Uh, so that I survive better, and so that, uh, so that I become 
uh, my dog's owner instead of my dog owns me. So, so, so that is the differences of the, the layers that I'm interested in. Uh, so, so, so for me here is a very long, very tall ladder and that every bottom line is what Jerry has been talking about. So some atoms and molecules uh, interacting with each other and maybe uh, at, at higher level you have, you have catalysts uh, uh, and uh, and then you have facilitators and higher and higher to the visa the, the, the area Lisa is paying attention to. So so maybe we need to find out some more clear. Uh, I'm just a roughly uh, by instinct perceiving this kind of uh, complexity level that uh, one builds over another and build up and up till all the way to this what we call spirituality or something something beyond the signs. Uh, a small, spirituality. A small, let, let me say that it, uh, at the end of this month, I'm going to present a talk on uh, basically the metaphysics of chemistry. Uh, and after that, uh, perhaps I can send something out that people might want to take take it on as a topic of description to, to me it's it's so uh, remote from the usual philosophy of science and the usual philosophy of engineering and cybernetics that i i tend not to really bring these issues up at all because i didn't feel there'd be any interest in them uh of approaching it from a quantitative perspective because it's so uh, remote from the accepted values of mathematics uh, and the way mathematicians and uh, their their colleagues have carved out their social space, uh, and how that social space of of those disciplines has become a dominant influence in the way culture develops. Uh, so I I've been reluctant to bring these things up very directly uh, from that perspective. But if people are really interested, I'll I'll be. You know, I can put together an abstract that might attract some attention and, and maybe some response. Robin, yes, please, Robin please. particularly might be interested in this. Uh, well, you, you might you might also be interested in in my book where I've I've also tr tried to make some contribution to this kind of area, exactly the area you're talking about. It's called thinking systems, and it, that's it. <laughs> Lisa's holding Very it. Very beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. A picture of my wife when we were walking on the. Camino de Fr to to Santiago in Spain. We we walked from Arles to Santiago. It's about a thousand miles <laughs> in three months. <laughs> took okay. us. Anyway, yeah. But it's um, it's the grounded spirituality, Jason, that that uh, that is really important. So it's this yeah. fountain of drawing from the earth, you know, and being grounded for that uh, belonging to and knowing ourselves as nature and then going up to the spiritual realms i mean that's this that flow of energy that keeps us in these challenging uh this is like someone said earlier this uh systems work is not for the faint of heart there is uh, <laughs> there's this uh most people do not think this way and uh, i you know i I noticed like uh, I've only recently started to kind of feel discouraged, but it, but, um, but it, because I don't understand back to that thing about kindness, the sign, you know, I don't understand meanness. My system does not comprehend it. And when I, when I meet it, it, um, it throws me off track because my because it throws me off my purpose which is sense making together so um it's that regeneration truly that uh the spirit mind and body need uh for um living fully this gift of life and uh so that's i think that's what unites everybody whether it's it's the space we can be for each other. It really has a lot to do with compassion. And in order for me to be compassionate, I have to have the space for it from myself first. 
right? So that that window of tolerance right now is really being tested. Right. I, I've got a lead, sorry. Just trying to make one clarification, Jerry. When I say black box, I don't mean to say there is a physical entity. I think of brain as an instantaneous conduit that just comes in, connects connection. the sensation to action. It's a it's an instantaneous connection. connection. And once that that sensation, the sensation action reflex is accomplished, the connection disappears. So it is not like a permanent structure black box that I'm talking about. It's the instantaneous connection. So GPS is an instantaneous connection, but the moment you made your turn, it's gone. So maybe the word black box is not a good term to use because it was used in the previous meetings that Jason had, I used it, but I will probably refrain from using it. What I mean to say is it is the conduit, it is the connection between the two complementary entities of an open system. So open system, each thing is on its own. Instantaneously, they interact and they disappear. That instantaneous well, interaction is what I'm called. I refer to it as black box, but probably it's a bad terminology. I'll take it back. Okay. So yes, that, that clarification is very, very helpful. A further yes. clarification might be to get word of the word, get rid of the word instantaneous. Well, at, at, at the time of memory, Mapping, There's, there is a flow, right? And the flow cannot happen within one instant. If in the brain, I'm saying when the sensation comes from a retina and goes through the thalamus, it gets the analog signal gets discretized into a digital frame, and that's a gamma frame that takes 25 milliseconds. It's not instantaneous, it is 25 milliseconds. Now, so you made the second correction, now we're on the same wavelength. Okay. <laughs> okay. Jerry, I, I where, actually, well, well, where Jerry, are you I, going to do your presentation, Jerry? What? Uh, it's to a private group of psychologists. Oh, okay. But so, if you, I, I, I will ask for, you know, if someone wants an invitation, I will send, ask the director. Yes, please, please, please. Yeah. Okay. Me okay. too. Okay. Two of you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much yeah. for today. Yeah. This is very uh, exciting, Jason? very interesting. Yes. This one, uh, the paper that I shared with you earlier on that I presented on uh, consciousness, uh, which which is based on the brain architecture, can you please share it with the group? Uh, okay. It may not be, it is short and it may not be easily readable, but it goes through a lot of the points that we discussed. So please share it with the attendees. Okay. And then I would love to get some feedback from uh, can all you the people can, can you resign it to me because I have sure. a, a tons of emails and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's already I'll buried it. somewhere. I'll send it right. Send it me again. Okay. 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 Sure. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.